How are we doing this morning? Good, good, good. Good to see all of y'all. Really excited to be with you today. We're going to look in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. If you'd like to go ahead and find that, you can turn with me in one of our free Bibles in the back to page 958. That's where we're going to be here in just a little bit. So I wanted to let you go ahead and find that before we get to it here in a moment. A friend of mine posted on social media here recently some thoughts from actor and comedian Tim Allen that he apparently shared on Fox's Hannity program. He says, here in California, I'm on the same list of essential workers as cops and doctors and firemen. Thus, I've worked constantly since March and kept my people in, employed. In fact, just last week, I was allowed to fly to Los Angeles to film a commercial. To get there, I boarded a sold-out flight where I sat cheek to jowl. If you don't know what the jowls are, I'll be happy to shake those for you at some point. It's this stuff here. With two perfect strangers, one of whom struggled to control a nasty cough behind her cloth mask. He asked, how is this sensible? How is it remotely fair? Why is filming a commercial essential, but running a restaurant is not? Why are crowded planes safe, but crowded churches not? And how can anyone expect a rational citizen to obey elected officials who refuse to follow their own rules? He says, I have no answers to these questions, but... As I waited last Thursday to answer whatever trenchant query Hannity might eventually throw my way, it occurred to me that the majority of people who punch their own ticket do so not merely because they feel irredeemable or deplorable. He says, I think most people hang on right till they come to believe that they have become non-essential. You see, the holidays are a rough time of year for a lot of people. In particular, this holiday was very rough. In particular, this particular year that we went through. To those millions of Americans, Americans who have lost their livelihoods, now teetering on the edge of your own metaphorical bridge, wondering if perhaps you're worth more dead than alive, Alan says this, You still matter. You are still essential to someone. I'm assuming that a lot of us are probably glad to say goodbye to 2020. It was a tough year. Stress, anxiety, nervous breakdown. And that's just my own stuff. Um, <laughs> coronavirus, quarantines, job-related issues, loss of loved ones, constant adjustments and uncertainty. N.T. Wright says in his book, God in the Pandemic, the question echoes down through the years with every new tragedy. Why did God allow this? Why didn't God step in and stop it? After all, so often when people look out on the world and it's disasters, they wonder, why doesn't God just march in and take over? Why, they ask, does He permit it? Why doesn't He send a thunderbolt? Or maybe perhaps something a little less like what a pagan deity might do, but still, and put things right. How many of you have ever asked the question, why? I first addressed this back in a sermon in May of 2017. It, it, it seems like it might be appropriate to address it again. You see, at some point, at some level, we want to know why. Why am I going through this? Fill in the blank. Why am I not hearing from God like I want to? Why am I in such a rut spiritually? Why do I not feel as connected to God as I want to be? Why is there so much evil and suffering in the world? Why would a loving God allow this particular thing to happen? As one pastor has said, I need to know. I, I, I need to know. 
You see, we have this insatiable desire that can lead to a healthy pursuit, but we must understand that we are not promised answers to all of our questions this side of heaven. I'm not even going to be able to answer many of the questions that you have personally today. But I do want to highlight a particular resource for you. This will be really good if you have some specific questions that you want to dive into. It's called, God, I've Got a Question, Biblical Truth for Our Deepest Concerns by Dr. James Merritt. It's a really good read, and I encourage you to get a copy of this if you want to dive in to some more specific areas. But please allow me this morning to set some parameters as we wrestle with the question, why? You see, it is okay. It is okay to ask God this question, but not to demand that He give you an answer. At some point, we must ask ourselves, am I okay with God having a higher sense of justice than my own? He is perfect. He is infinite. He is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. He is ever-present. And can I trust Him to do what is right versus pursuing and trusting my own limited view of reasoning? Because I am imperfect. I am finite, and I am limited. See, it's okay to ask the question, but it's not okay to demand an answer because of who He is and who we are and who we're not. Can you trust Him to do what is right because He has a higher sense of justice than you and I do versus pursuing our own limited view of understanding. You see, we tend to be okay with God intervening and preventing murder and rape and sickness, death, natural disaster, and so on, but not with losing the freedom to make our own choices on other levels, right? The fact that you and I even have the ability, the free will to even be at this point in our thinking is evidence enough of God's gift of free will in our lives. If God took away your free will regarding what you wanted, would you be okay with losing your freedom to make choices in other areas? Hello? Can't say amen, say ouch. If God took away free will regarding what you wanted, would you be okay with losing your freedom to make choices in other areas? You see, God gives you the most sacred gift of the prerogative of choice, but God, but God does not give you the privilege of determining a different outcome to what that choice may entail. We are free to choose. We are not free not to choose. We are not free to choose the consequences of our choices. Well, what does that mean? We're free to choose. We get to make certain choices and decisions. We're not free not to choose. We have to make a choice. You had to make a choice today. Am I going to get up and come to church and worship with my faith family? Or am I going to stay in bed? Am I going to watch it online? Am I going to do this? Am I going to do that? We have to make certain choices. But we are not free to choose the consequences of our choices. Even when we respond to faith in Jesus Christ, we are putting our faith, our trust in Him to let that play out like he says it's supposed to. We're trusting him. Even with soul competency, God has given us the free will, the choice to make certain decisions and choices in matters of faith and religion to be able to respond to him or not. He has given us that gracious gift. I want to add a few questions to, to this discussion today because I think they're so very important. These are personal ones that I have. Maybe you can relate as well. First, why do some equate belief with, un in, with understanding in relation to the things of God? You see, there are many things that I believe but not, do not fully understand. That's where, that's where faith kicks in. We trust and obey, especially in the matters of God. But you know, when I flip on a light in my house, I don't have to know how electricity functions and all the processes it goes through. I just trust it's going to happen. I don't, I don't have to fully understand it to believe it. Second, just because we do not fully understand certain passages in the Bible 
Does that mean we get to discredit its overall focus and plan of redemption? I mean, when we look at the Old Testament and people have problems with the Old Testament, we've got to take that in context because maybe there's just not a, a really good contemporary application, but it, it doesn't discredit the overall message. And third, why is there so much evil and suffering in the world? I know a lot of people wrestle with this because I've had conversations with them. I wrestled with it so much that it was a research paper topic that I chose when I was in seminary. I wrote a paper on the problem of evil. You see, if you struggle with the problem of evil and suffering in our world, or you wonder how could such a good and loving God allow suffering, then you obviously must be one of the greatest Jesus fans on the planet. Why? Why do I say that? Because Jesus was the only truly good person. And bad things happened to him. In fact, he was the only perfect, the only innocent person. And he endured the vilest evil and the worst suffering of all time. Who in all of history endured the greatest injustice? The greatest evil, the greatest suffering. Who paid the highest price ever paid for undeserved wickedness, pain, and anguish? Jesus did. Looking at evil and suffering through the prism of the cross is the ultimate game changer for us. The question changes from, why did you do this to me, God? To, why did you do that for me? It only stands to reason that if God could bring eternal benefits such as salvation, eternal life, forgiveness, and joy through the evil done to Jesus, then He certainly can do the same in our own suffering. Man, I hope you, I hope you meditate on that for a little bit. Mm -hmm, that's something good to chew on. Woo! Sorry, I get to talking to myself up here. And that's kind of how it goes. I, you see, another sobering thought flows from the river of suffering Christ endured. Imagine the greater evil the human race would have experienced if God had not allowed the greatest evil of all. Have you ever thought about that? The greatest good, eternal life, and complete forgiveness would never have occurred, and the greatest suffering, hell, would still await us all if Jesus hadn't done what he did on our behalf. You see, God sees every possible outcome of every possible action. And the cross tells us that we can and must trust his hand to fit all evil and suffering into his glory and for our good. You see, evil has intruded into God's creation and it can only can only be solved through Jesus' redeeming work on the cross. You see, the answers to our why questions are found in a relationship with the one that we should be pursuing. Jesus. We get to know Him personally by spending time in His Word. But, now just hear me out here. I'm about to go from preaching to meddling. Just a little bit. Just a little, just a little bit. I'm not going to meddle too much. Miss Novella, where are you at? I don't, want, I don't want anything thrown at me. I can't see real good with these lights in my face. It's hard for a Christian to hear from God with a closed Bible and a distracted focus. It's hard for us to understand why He does what He does and allows what He allows when we don't seek to know Him on a deep, personal, intimate level. And what does that mean anyway? What does that mean anyway? I mean, most of us dudes don't even know how to do that with our wives. Ladies, this would be a good opportunity for you to amen. Um, give a little nudge. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, that's what my wife would be doing. Mm-hmm. See, I believe the most common mistake we make in our relationship with the Lord is seeking an experience versus seeking Him. 
We look for a feeling, and if it happens, we conclude that we have worshipped. Pastor Tanner explored this with us last week to help us understand what true worship is all about. God wants us to sense His presence, but He is more concerned with us trusting Him than feeling Him. And during times of spiritual dryness and questioning, we must rely on God's promises, not our emotions. Because faith, not feelings, is what pleases God. Charles Swindoll says, distance from God is a frightening thing. God will never adjust His agenda to fit ours. He will not speed His pace to catch up with ours. We need to slow our pace in order to recover our walk with Him. We must adapt to His style. We need to conform to His way if our lives are to be characterized by the all-encompassing word, godliness. We need to conform to His way if our lives are to be characterized by the all-encompassing word, godliness. Sounds kind of like surrender, does it not? We need to lay down our will and pick up His. We need to focus on Him versus ourselves. We need to pursue His agenda versus our own. And only then will we begin to walk intimately with Christ. You see, godliness, Christ likeness, that's our goal as believers, right? But how, how do we do that? How do busy people living fast paced and complicated lives, facing relentless pressures, consistently walk with God? This is a challenge for me in my own life with all the different things we're pulled in all these different directions of home and work and kids and finances and all this different types of stuff. Remember, it is a process. It's going to take time and deliberate effort on your part to become like Jesus. But how do we become more godly when we live in a world that is dead set on tearing us away from Him? From tearing us away from our first love and our pursuit of intimacy with Him. James talks about this in the New Testament. He talks about the tug of war that we experience, of the divided affection of, are we going to pursue the world? Are we going to pursue Christ? Are we going to be a friend of the world? Are we going to be a friend of Jesus? We have to make that decision of where our affection is going to focus. One word. That's how we do it. It's discipline. We must return to the spiritual disciplines. We must study, memorize, and meditate on Scripture. We must spend time in prayer, communicating, communing, fellowshipping, listening to God, fasting, removing things from our lives for a season or a time to pursue intimate fellowship with Him. Journaling, sharing our faith, disciple-making, all these different things add to the disciplines that will help us become more like Jesus. But are we engaging in these? You see, here at Colonial, we offer classes and studies and groups and all kind of resources. You've heard us talk about the 21-day fast. We put stuff on the app, the website. It's not that we're struggling for more information or opportunities. You see, at some point, you must identify where you are on this journey and take the appropriate next step. At some point, you're going to have to earn it. Own it, not earn it, own it. You're going to have to own where you are and figure out what next step you need to take. I love how A.W. Tozer puts it. He says, probably the most widespread and persistent problem to be found among Christians is the problem of retarded spiritual progress. Why, after years of Christian profession, he says, do so many persons find themselves no farther along than when they first believed? The Christian is strong or weak depending upon how closely he has cultivated the knowledge of God. And this is not looking at just gaining more knowledge. It's gaining that knowledge so you can put it into practice where wisdom comes about and you understand what God is calling you to and what He wants you to do so He's working through you and the rest of us as the body of Christ to meet needs in this world, not just, oh, well, I'm I'm so ready to go to heaven. There's work to be done here. 
You see, if you look at studies on people's attitudes regarding the Bible, it's easy to get discouraged. The vast majority of Americans aren't really interested in knowing God's Word, much less putting it into practice and living it out. You see, if you believe in Christ, if you have accepted His sacrifice on the cross, the payment on behalf of your sins, if you have committed to living your life with God's will and desires as your guides, if you have done these things, not knowing God's Word is unacceptable. It's unacceptable. Here's the deal. God gave us His Word and His Spirit. So we could know Him, His story, and His ways. We can't separate our belief, our faith, or our following from studying and knowing the Bible. It is literally impossible to separate that. It's impossible. So what keeps you from studying the Bible? Is it time? Lack of desire? Are you intimidated? Do you think it's boring? Does the conviction of Scripture make you uncomfortable on some level? You see, the most important thing you can do as a Christ follower who is committed to growing in their faith is to figure out what keeps you from reading the Bible. And once you know what it is, it's real complicated, this is real deep, this is real theological, fix it. Right? We, we, we can all get that right. Once we identify the problem then we need to fix it. Okay? We need to change something. Read your Bible. But don't stop there. Let the words of Scripture affect your life. Live out the words of God. It's what He has intended all along. I want you to repeat after me. Do not. Oh, come on now. Come on. Come on. Don't, don't make me do this again. You folks know. Y'all know. I ain't going to let you fall asleep. Somebody said it in the cafe before they came in here, right? If you think you're going to fall asleep in here when I'm teaching, it ain't going to happen. You're going to participate. Do not. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about right there. Merely listen to the Word of God. And so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Do not. Merely listen to the Word. And so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Do, it says. Do what it says. Do what it says. Mm-hmm. So you can't walk out of here today going, well, I guess I want to read my Bible and do what it says. <laughs> no, you need to read it. You need to do what it says. Man, dive into James 1.22 and then look at verses 23 through 24 because he goes on to say, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Now ladies, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take a stab here. Y'all ain't never found a mirror you didn't like. Mm-hmm. I bet you looked in a mirror today. And I was, now I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed or the brightest crayon in the box, but I would, I would, I would bet that if you saw something out of place, you would fix it before you left the house. Am I right? Can I get an amen? amen. Thank you. So when we look into the mirror of God's Word, and our lives are not matching up with the truth claims of Scripture that point us to the Word, which is Jesus, we need to make an adjustment. We need to fix it. John 8, 31 says, If you abide in my Word, then you are truly disciples of mine. I want you to listen to Paul's advice to his son in the faith, Timothy. We're in verse, um, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Verses 1 through 10. And I want to specifically emphasize verse 7. Not all of this is going to be on the screens. I'm going to read these 10 verses to you for context. So follow along with me. And we're going to come back to and emphasize verse 10 at the very end of the message. Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last time some will turn away from the true faith. 
They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. These people are hypocrites and liars, and their consciences are dead. They will say it is wrong to be married and wrong to eat certain foods, but God created those foods to be eaten with thanks by faithful people who know the truth. Since everything God created is good, we should not reject any of it, but receive it with thanks. For we know it is made acceptable by the word of God in prayer. If you explain these things to the brothers and sisters, Timothy, you will be a worthy servant of Christ Jesus, one who is nourished by the message of faith and the good teaching you have followed. Lock in right here for me. Do not waste time arguing over godless ideals, ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, train yourself to be godly. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better, promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. This is why we work hard and continue to struggle, for our hope is in the living God who is the Savior of all people and particularly of all believers. Train yourself to be godly, or as the New American Standard states, Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. You see, as valuable as physical fitness may be, Paul is not saying here that it's not important. But his point was to say spiritual fitness or godliness is of more value. Physical fitness is profitable only literally for a little while. But godliness is profitable for all things, not merely in this present life, but in the life to come, that is, for eternity. Godliness colors all aspects of temporal and eternal life, bestowing all its blessings on everything that it touches. Paul is essentially saying to Timothy, it's time to get serious about your walk with God. It's not just going to happen. You ain't going to be able to lay your head on a textbook and go to sleep and wake up and take the test and ace it. Yeah, you got to be intentional with some of this. So I need to ask you, what's missing in your life? Are you in a group here at Colonial doing life together with other people? Are you serving on a team? Are you engaging in spiritual conversations? Are you making disciples like Jesus has challenged us, commanded us to do? You see, even in the midst of doing some spiritual things, not religious, but truly spiritual things, we can fail to discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness. Our goal is intimacy, and according to Scripture, intimacy with God requires spiritual disciplines. But what about those times when God seems out of touch, when God seems distant, when I've done all the things that Scripture has encouraged me to do, and... I'm still not encountering that intimacy. I'm not experiencing what I desire. See if you can relate. I pass, I pass, I fast, I pray. I'm in the Word like I should be, but still nothing. I've evaluated and examined. I've confessed and repented of every sin I'm aware of. I've met with my accountability partner, otherwise counsel. I'm plugged in. I'm serving. I'm sharing my faith. I'm discipling people. Maybe you're doing too much, not enough, or these are not even the right questions to be asking during this particular season of your life. Well, gee, thanks, Pastor, that helps a lot. <laughs> Chapter 14 of his book, The Purpose Driven Life, Rick Warren addresses this issue. He said, the deepest level of worship is praising God in spite of pain, thanking God during a trial, trusting Him when tempted, surrendering while suffering, and loving Him when He seems distant. Whenever you feel tempted to ask God, why did you do this to me? Look at the cross and ask, why did you do that for me? To mature your friendship, God will test it with periods of seeming separation, time when it feels as if He has abandoned or even forgotten you. God feels a million miles away. 
St. John of the Cross referred to these days of spiritual dryness, doubt, and estrangement as the dark night of the soul. Others have called it the winter of the heart. Henry Nouwen called them the ministry of absence. A.W. Tozier called them the ministry of the night. David, in the Old Testament, who was referred to as the man after God's own heart, frequently complained of God's apparent absence. Go back and read the Psalms if you think I'm making this up. Floyd McClung describes it this way. You wake up one morning and all your spiritual feelings are gone. You pray, but nothing happens. You rebuke the devil, but it doesn't change anything. You go through spiritual exercises. You have your friends pray for you. You confess every sin you can imagine. Then you go around asking forgiveness of everyone you know. You fast, still nothing. You begin to wonder how long the spiritual gloom will last. Days? Weeks? Months? Will it ever end? It feels as if your prayers simply, simply are bouncing off the ceiling and not getting through. In utter desperation, you cry out, What's the matter with me? Why? What's going on? You see, this list that I read to you, these were some very spiritual people. But yet they experienced dry points and low points. Times in their life when they felt disconnected from God. They asked, why? Listen to this statement by Warren. God's, God's omnipresence and the manifestation of His presence are two different things. One is fact. The other is often a feeling. God is always present even when you are unaware of Him. And His presence is too profound to be measured by mere emotion. I want to challenge you that during those times of God's apparent absence to focus on faith, trust, and obedience instead of feelings and emotions. And just because you can't feel God's presence or you don't feel saved or you have lost that feeling you had when you first came to know Christ doesn't mean that God has abandoned you, that you are not a Christian, or you can't regain that passion for Him that you once had. Please listen carefully. Walking with God is not based on a feeling or an emotion. It's based on His promises revealed to us in His Word, and He, I want you to hear me say this, He is trustworthy. He is trustworthy. The important question only you can answer, will you continue to love, trust, and obey and worship God when you have no sense of His presence or visible evidence of His work in your life? That's the question we've got to wrestle with. You see, we must dive into His Word and allow the Spirit to open our eyes in order to be reassured. And I hope you'll jot these things down. I, I, I didn't put them in the notes, but if you, if you miss them or you want to go back to them, I'm going to be hanging around after service, or you can feel free to email me, but I, I want to give you something to have some further study here. And I, I wish I had time to explore this with you, but in Genesis 15, verses 1 through 6, Abraham, Abram at this time was childless, but he still trusted God to carry out the plan that he had presented. In Genesis 39, we see in the case of Joseph that God was distant, but he was not absent. Gosh, go back and sit with this. Genesis 15, 1 through 6, and Genesis 39, to see how they wrestled with these things, to see how they trusted God to carry out what he had told them he was going to do. And they wrestled with these why questions that we have as well. So what can I do to gain intimacy with Christ and better understand why? Trust and obey. Trust and obey. Spiritual maturity is not measured by the amount of biblical knowledge you have or how many times you walk in this building. However, it can be measured by how you respond to life's circumstances by trusting and obeying Him even when your questions go unanswered. I love how Paul David Tripp puts it. 
He says we don't have to live plagued by the anxiety of the unknown. We don't have to go to sleep wondering what the next day will bring or wake up working our way through all of what ifs we can think of. We don't have to seek some means to figure out what we will never be able to figure out. No, we can rest when we are confused. We can experience peace in the face of unknown. We can feel an inner well-being while living in the middle of mystery. Why? Why can we do that? Because our peace of heart does not rest on how much we know, how much we have figured out, or how accurately we have been able to predict the future. No, our rest is in the person who holds our individual futures in His wise and gracious hands. We have peace because we know that He will complete the good things that He in grace has initiated in our lives. He is faithful, so He never leaves the work of His hands. He is gracious, so He gives us what we need, not what we deserve. He is wise, so that He does what is always best. He is sovereign, so He rules all the situations and locations where we live. He is powerful, so He can do what He pleases when He pleases. Paul says it well in Philippians 1, 6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a work in you will bring it unto completion in the day of Christ Jesus. Are you experiencing anxiety because you've forgotten who you are and what you've been given? Are you experiencing the fear that results from trying to know what you'll never know? He knows, he cares, and he will complete the job he has begun in you and in me. See, the good news, the gospel, is that Jesus lived the life you and I were supposed to live. And we jacked it up. So he died the death you and I were destined to die. But Jesus, he took our place and he satisfies what God has required for the payment of our sin. As Christ followers, our hope is in Jesus. In verse 10 of our focus text, back in 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul shows us the struggle is worth it because our hope is set not on ourselves or some philosophy of life or other people or non-existent gods, but our hope is in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially to those who will believe. Here at Colonial, we want to help you do a few things. We want to help you move from unbelief to belief. We want to help you move from unconnected to connected. We want to help you move from just a casual attender to a contributing member of this local expression of the church. And how do we do that? It's very simple. Trust and obey. But have you? Are you? Do you need to? Will you? At the conclusion of our service today, we'll have some folks down front as normal that would love to introduce you to Jesus to help you trust Him for the very first time. Maybe just to pray with you with some of the struggles that you're having. Maybe you need to take a next step. You need to follow through with baptism. You need to figure out how you can join a group or serve on a team. That's what they're here for. They want to help you take that next step. I hope at the conclusion of our service that you will take advantage of that opportunity today.